Hello everyone, um, my name is Ben. Um, full name is done there, uh, but you can just call me Ben. Uh, I'm going to see it at the end again if you want to contact me. Um, thank you very much for having me. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about how we use WASM in one of our projects, in our new upcoming projects actually, uh, to create a hot upgradable uh, runtime on a blockchain. Um, I work for a company called Parity. Uh, who here knows of Parity? Okay, a, a, a few. Um, you get stickers. There's plenty of stickers down here. Um, black and white, take yourself. Um, we're probably most known for this one, Parity Ethereum, which is an Ethereum client uh, that, that we've been building for a couple of years. Uh, the second biggest project is a, a Bitcoin client that we've built. They're all in Rust. We're very big and long-term Rust fans, and we built almost... Do we build anything in not Rust? Oh yeah, we have JavaScript frameworks um, to do some front-end stuff. Um, other projects that we have, though, are not also not blockchain uh, specific, although it's in the crypto space, if you will, like uh, Ethereum wallets or um, offline wallets, as well as uh, Secret Store, which is on the blockchain, as well as the Parity Bridge, which is also uh, uh, on the blockchain, which is compiled to EVM. I think that's also basically Rust. Um, but then also, like stuff falls out of there that is not necessarily something. Um, we always intend to build, but we need for other projects. One of them is our WASM interpreter, the Parity WASM uh, stack, which was also mentioned very often in one of the recent blog posts that was about the state of WASM that exists. Um, our version was mentioned there a lot. Or the Coven, which is a, a second generation network. In general, what we do is we build next generation crypto tech infrastructure because we can, and it's fun. Um, today I would like to talk to you about our new project, which is Parity Substrate, um, which we started building because of Polkadot. Um, and in order to understand why we do what we do and why, why it is necessary what we do, I would like to briefly talk to you about Polkadot. So Polkadot is the idea that there's a pl plenty of blockchains out there, and I'm going to come back to what that actually means and if, you're, if you're not familiar with that. And um, Polkadot is, is a project by the Web3 Foundation to create a, a protocol that allows blockchains to talk with one another, generally exchange messages, not only tokens, aka money, but any type of message in general. Um, that is meant to be an interoperability layer, uh, and as all things Web3, um, it is supposed to enforce order and um, validity of those messages. Uh, so unlike TCP, where the order is not guaranteed by the network, with this protocol, the order would be guaranteed to you um, when you come to, when you connect your chain to this chain. And through developing this, um, which is a blockchain itself, we've noticed very quickly that what we have been doing in Parity Ethereum and now do in this project, there's a lot of things that are common, that are very, you could say, standard um, in order if you want to build a blockchain. And we started building our own uh, framework to build blockchains, which we now build Polkadot on, which is Substrate. So Substrate, in general, is a Polkadot-compatible general-purpose blockchain development kit. If you are intending to build your next blockchain, make an ICO and get rich and all that stuff um, <laughs> that, that you hear about, and you want to do it in Rust, you might want to check out Substrate. Um, because one feature that it has is that it allows you to hot upgrade the runtime of the blockchain itself. Um, and the way we do that is through uh, WebAssembly. So who here can tell me what a blockchain is? Who wants to? Let's have that, yeah. Okay. General, just yeah, yeah. very... Yeah, it's a chain of blocks, but that's, that's the obvious one. Uh, the idea is that uh, blocks uh, have some sort of sequence. They point at previous blocks and they say, I trust this one, I've verified this one, looks okay. Oh, microphone. Yes. Um, so you have a chain of blocks, and the blocks point at blocks that are in the past. They say this one looks okay, thereby verifying it. And you build upon these 
blocks trading on more stuff at the end. Uh, and you can store information in them. And in more advanced cases, you can also do computation on them, like on Ethereum. So what's in a block? Uh, anything. It depends on the blockchain. In, in a Bitcoin block, there can be like arbitrary data. And there's also uh, the hash of the previous block that says, yeah, this one is good. I trust it. That, that is correct. So in, in general, what we talk about, it's, it's a log of state transitions. Um, and these transitions are bundled in a block, hence the name block. And then whenever you create a new block, it references the previous block that it says, that was a trade state transition, the state effectively that happened. And on that, please apply these following trade state transitions. As you said, in the Bitcoin case, the, the set of state transitions basically around, um, are around um, moving things in a ledger from one account to another. But there's also general purpose chains where you can, what they call, execute smart contracts, um, which is, for example, what Ethereum allows you to do, where you can store a, a program and then you can, through a later transition, um, invoke that program with specific parameters. And the, it becomes that chain part because every block references its parent, and that goes all the way back to what is considered the genesis block. And so it means that anybody can take that first block and then just run all these transitions through and verify that the state that you are claiming the system is supposed to be in is exactly that one that it's supposed to be in because you can just apply them yourself. That's generally a blockchain. Um, the specifics, however, as I mentioned before, depend on the blockchain that you're implementing. Like the Bitcoin blockchain, even though on a protocol layer it could talk with other blockchains, it wouldn't understand its blocks because the, the, the set of features that this chain provides and also like things like what crypto it is using in order to verify these things, they depend on the, the particular blockchain that you are looking at. And this is where we get the idea of having multiple blockchains from because they use different consensus algorithms or a different crypto because they 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 provide different features like some of some of them you cannot really provide hardware for to to make faster some you actually do build the blockchain in order to make them very very fast with specific technology um, but that is always dependent on the specific blockchains that you do so in that in that context how general can a general purpose blockchain system really be. Um, and we've tried to make it as general as possible by saying, we don't know what's in your block. It's an abstract block format. It's just a binary block to most of substrate. Um, it's therefore also very often just called extrinsic because it doesn't have to be a state transition for uh, in, in the idea of uh, substrate. <clears throat> You can plug in your own crypto database that you like to use your storage with this. Different features that different um, databases allow you to do. So depending on what kind of chain you want to do, you might have big data that you want to move through, and then it's um, and then you don't need to look it up very often. And that that kind of feature set is something that you can actually um, decide upon. The same is for consensus. So which consensus algorithm you're using? Meaning, how do you figure out what is the next valid blog that is consensus. There's different uh, methods to do that. One of the, the most famous one uh, is the Bitcoin one, where basically anybody could prove the, the, the puzzle and therefore create the next block. Um, but there's also the upcoming more common ones are coming out of the cluster, database cluster management systems like Raft or Paxa systems where you have a very small set of authorities who's allowed to create or decide upon what is the next state conditions, you can choose which ones you like. Um, it has an extensible networking layer, which is based on libp2p, which is also a project that we've been implementing for the Protocol Labs um, uh, organization. Uh, most famously, this is the basic layer that they use to build IPFS on top. Um, and we're using the same basic technology uh, on the bottom. Um, there's a uh, CLI interface, an RPC interface, and all of them are extensible. So you can decide that you want more features on that very quickly and very easily. But most importantly, it, these, these abstract 
there's an abstract execute block function that we give this abstract block to. <laughs> Excuse me. And this is where the magic happens. When you think of a substrate node, it's actually two things. There's substrate, and then there's the actual chain runtime. Um, this division makes sense once you have done multiple chains, and we have done, aside from the, no, the, the three known ones that I mentioned before, we have experimented with a lot of sets of chains. There's a, a bunch of things that are common, like the networking layer, the, C, the this, um, CLI interface, and, and other parts that are just very common and they don't have to um, bother about too much um, between different chains. But then the, exactly what I said before, what is actually in your block and what is allowed to happen in, within a block, that is very chain specific and can be almost arbitrary. So the idea that the, the general structure of substrate is that there's a lot of stuff provided around it and then there's this one time in the middle that effectively gives one function to the outside, exposes one function, and that is called execute block. And now when, when we see a new block come in, um, what happens is that Substrate receives that block through the networking layer and does some general checks. Like um, you, you configure it, this is the hashing algorithm, so we make sure that whatever block we got in, it didn't get corrupted on the, on the networking layer. And then it hands that over to that runtime and say, just execute that block, whatever that is, because Substrate doesn't know. Um, that usually does some form of consensus check. It checks whether that is a valid block within the frame of the chain itself. So has it been author uh, authored and signed by an appropriate authority? Or in the case of Bitcoin, does it have a puzzle that actually works? For substrate, it doesn't really matter, but for your specific chain, it does. Um, it then executes the state transitions, assuming that the block is valid. It executes the, 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 the transitions that are in the block, which effectively um, call get state and set state down on substrate, which is provided by the, um, by the internal database. Um, and at the end of that, if everything uh, worked out and the, the entire set of transitions is not failing, which Substrate also uh, provides a, an in-between layer for, like a classic transaction system, you only do that transaction if everything works, the block is stored, so you can also give it to others later. As mentioned before, this is all provided by Substrate, but it's being called out from the chain. So the chain decides when and how it calls these functions and when and how it allows these functions to be called. In general, the chain doesn't expose those functions but provides a layer in between of another set of functions, its own abstraction of allowing you to do something. Simple example again, Bitcoin doesn't allow you to just do a set state but um, do a, a, a account transfer function which then checks that you actually have the balance and that whatever the new balance is supposed to be and in the end of that calculation if everything checks out it does a set 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 state does that make sense so far because that's important that we get that it's basically key value store at that point um, allows um, substrate uh, snapshots mm -hmm. like the of the sync, yeah, yeah. Um, it uh, no, uh, uh, substrate uh, snapshots like the Ethereum uh, list of uh, how many amount anyone has. Uh, Warp sync, yes, it will. It doesn't at this very moment though, but it will. It's a it's a common feature that we uh, actually broken Ethereum lately, but um, it's going to get fixed soon. Um, there is one one special case though that Substrate knows about, and that is if you set state on the key column code. Then what you provide is expected to be a WebAssembly runtime. So we briefly talked about WebAssembly. Is everybody aware here what WebAssembly web is? Or do you, somebody wants to get a really brief. Go ahead. It's a tiny virtual machine that is running on all browsers, but it's not limited to browsers. Uh, that provides a very minimal 
uh, interface for a very few methods that you can call from the outside to get data in and out. And uh, that will maybe in the future allow us to have platform independent runtimes which are very minimal and can be implemented in a very efficient way. Um, something like assembly for the web, but maybe something bigger, we will see. Exactly that. It's a web standard that has been um, defined a couple of years back, I think 2015 as well. Um, and it's, <clears throat> it's a basic set of safe assembly that you have on almost all platforms and that you can more or less consider safe. Uh, and that is primarily was primarily developed to allow for almost native speed um, runtime in browsers. Um, as it is an assembly language, you can technically write that yourself, but as with most assembly today, you don't want to, especially if you're in a Rust user group, you probably don't. Um, so it's, it is also generally meant as a compiled target. Um, and Rust was actually the first language to support WASM as a primary target. Um, so you can write your Rust code, and almost all of the time, you can compile it to a, a WASM binary by now pretty smoothly. And as you also mentioned, they are usually executed in a sandboxed virtual environment. I refrain to use the word virtual, um, virtual machine because it turns out most implementations won't use that, but actually have um, more or less trans translate the actual um, ASM keys into the whatever native version of ASM there is and just have some sandboxing around to do memory management and constrain it. So it's closer to the way that operating systems manage that rather than virtual machines usually do. But essentially that's it. Like it's a, it's a binary blob of your code um, that is at almost native speed. And so this you can actually put into the chain. The, the runtime itself can say, call in code, here's a new WASM blob. Because I cheated you a little bit when I said that these are the two steps that happen. Um, because in the second step, a very important, small different thing happens. And that is that Substrate actually looks up what is the version of the code at that moment for that block, which is the very first line. Is that, can you see read that? Okay. And then it figures out um, through this little line here, um, whether the native version that we are currently running, the Rust native version, is compatible with the version that has been implemented on the chain. In that case, we're just using the, the current version that we have, the native call. So most of the time, we don't actually have to set up the entire environment and actually do all of that, because at least for us in parity, the, the Rust code base for the WASM binary and the Rust code base for the executors are actually the same Rust code base. We are simply building um, that new version. However, if you have, you are running an older client and you have not upgraded recently, so your version might not be compatible, what you do is you build that sandbox environment and you run that, um, that new block that you get through the, the code that was actually put on the chain. I give you a, a few minutes of a, of a darker slide to, to let that sink in um, and explain to you what this runtime version effectively looks like. Um, this is almost the, the version. There's a, a few other things in there, but they don't matter for, for the case we're talking about. So runtime version is basically just the struct having two strings. One is the specification name just basically the name of the chain that you want to do, um, and an implementation name, which is the idea that there might be other people who want to implement that same specification um, and provide their version of the of the button binary, and then they are still considered to be compatible because they're supposed to do the same specification. Um, uh, similar down here, we have the, the version of that specification. It's just an integer that, that goes up. Um, and a minor version that tells us if there have been other changes. The idea of the minor version is really like in, in the same way idea of minor version, meaning that if we do our check, the two things we actually check is, is that spec, is the spec that we have um, running here on our, on our version? And if that version the same as our version? 
and we ignore the minor version because this is supposed to be only um, minor non-breaking bug fixes and speed improvements, which means that we probably want to use the native version because it's still going to be faster than the Wasm version, even if it has a speed improvement. Now that I, I got you off that idea again, we come back to what that actually means. And that is that our execute block function can actually call the set state of a new piece of code while running its block, while doing its, in its implementation, which means that from the next block onwards, we're not executing this runtime anymore. We're going to be executing that just provided runtime without restarting, without the person running that node even knowing that happened or having to agree at it at all, the chain can upgrade itself. And that's because of wasn't. And that's awesome, in case you didn't notice. I see, I see a lot of, I'm, I'm wondering if you're just trying to grasp what is happening or if you're doubting what is happening. <laughs> go ahead. Okay. Yeah, please, please go ahead. So in order to make sure that not just anybody can upload new code, you will have to implement your own consensus check to make sure that maybe like the vast majority of the network has to agree on this new runtime or something? I come back to that in two slides. Okay, all right. Are there other questions or did everyone else get what is going on in general? I, I continue because nobody interrupts me. Um, Exactly going into that uh, direction is, oh, please, please go ahead. Coming back to that slide. How do other protocols manage upgrading their code or their implementation? Like, not at all or? Um, what, is, what is the previous way? What, what? Restarting usually, downloading and restarting firmware, whatever upgrade you do, like even your phone, they all do it that way, right? Okay, thank you. I would say. Like even, even browsers can't do that today. Thank you. They only run after the next one. There's actually one um, particular case. Um, I, I don't know if you heard of, of, uh, about a software called um, Erlang. Uh, it's a programming language from the early 90s for, uh, developed in Ericsson, which was meant to run on um, telephone routing systems, which never stop. They can't. They simply can't stop. Um, and so effectively what they did in, in their virtual environment, in their virtual machine actually, they have a continuous loop at some one point um, that would run for basically every port. And so while it has is holding a, a phone call, it's still running whatever code there is, you could load new code on it and in the next loop cycle it would just switch to the new one, which means that the old phone is not interrupted but the next time you hang up, it would execute the next new code cycle, uh, which is similar, if you will, um, to that, although there it would be native because it's all running in that. So they did that. They did that in uh, 1992, and um, even earlier, um, small talk was self-upgrading all the time. It's actually pretty amazing. You should look at that. Um, but coming back to what we do here, <laughs> Uh, as a general purpose framework, and coming back to your question as well, uh, we're always uh, struggling with the question of like that minimum effort which we want people to be able to deploy their own chain with uh, the minimum amount of work they have to do uh, is definitely at odds at being the most free and choosing what you want to do. So um, rather than opting for one side or the other, which other frameworks often do, we decided to go for a stacked approach where we allow for um, different degrees of freedom depending on the amount of effort you're willing to take in. Um, the easiest is down here, substrate node, is, uh, is a YAML file that you can configure your entire chain with. But you have to use basically a lot of opinionated ideas that Parity put in in order to be able to do that. And you have to uh, accept how we think accounting should work on the chain. If you want to do that yourself uh, instead though, you can go move one step further up and say you use Substrate, but you, you only use some of the modules of the Substrate runtime module library. 
which is a set of modules that we provide, Rust code, obviously, that we can also compile and they are all can all be compiled to Wasm, um, that you can plug together to produce a set of features for your chain that you might want to have. Um, the very common one that people always ask for is like contracts, which is effectively the way um, as Ethereum smart contracts work, just that it doesn't have an EVM in our version here. You could implement an EVM, which is the Ethereum virtual machine, which is a different set of commands. Um, we actually have a WASM runtime as well. So you could create a chain that allows people to upload their contracts, their small programs as WASM themselves and, and run that. Uh, and then from within the WASM runtime, we spawn a different WASM runtime that actually um, allows you to execute that contract. And the thing that you were talking about is like how, how would then this chain allow set code to happen, for example. Um, we also come with a, with a starting set of features for that. So um, if you use Node, our, our default setup for this, uh, you have to hold a referendum about changing the code. So you upload a new version of the code and then a referendum needs to happen. In that particular case, that goes through the council, which is um, at least X percent of coin holders and that moment in the network need to agree that this happens within, I think you can configure that, but by default 60 next blocks. If it doesn't happen, the, the patch is not applied. But if they agree, then it immediately becomes valid and it becomes valid for all nodes that want to continue with that chain meaning that 60 blocks later, everyone runs the new version of the code. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, just to make sure that you understand what that means, Bitcoin, um, at the end of last year, after discussing for a very long time, um, decided that they implement a feature where they upgrade the block size, and they decided that if by the end of this year, 80% of the nodes in the network actually have that feature to be able to do that, then it would switch on automatically. And then okay. <laughs> well, what I'm, what I'm getting at is we're talking about a, a release time frame that is in decentralized networks actually a big issue, a release and actually having it deployed every time frame of one and a half years. That's really slow. <laughs> yes. Uh, please take the mic wherever it is. Oh, you have it already. So, is this on? Yeah. In the traditional uh, consensus protocol, uh, the consensus work before be because forks are short-lived. So it means that if, if there's a, a fork that's destined to death, it still gets to happen. It still gets to execute on, on some clients. Uh, so that means that in the worst case, there are going to be some clients which execute uh, random code that you allow for people to distribute inside uh, the previous block. So how, how do you deal with malicious code in, that will get executed? And how do you deal with rollbacks? Um, so this is where this always becomes a little tricky because we're, we're increasing the levels of abstraction in here. We don't allow you to execute arbitrary code. Um, your genesis block contains a configuration of what is possible on your chain. Um, it's not arbitrary. It's like you, you deploy the first set of nodes effectively. Um, they need to still download your client that someone provided um, and connect to your chain to be able to talk and decide what feature set of transitions are accessible. Um, for example, in Polkadot, the way that we manage messaging between two chains is a relay chain that relays from one thing to another. So effectively, the, the, the only command you can do there is, hey, I'm sending this message to X signed Alice. That's not arbitrary code. It's just like a, a different set of, of functionality that is provided. Um, within the contracts network, which is more what you're getting at, like what, what Ethereum does, um, this one uses the Ethereum idea of gas. Whenever you want to execute a contract, you pay 
um, a certain amount of gas that gets used up when executing the contract um, because of the the you never know whether the thing ends or not. Whenever you run out of gas, the contract stops executing, even if it didn't finish, um, and you're at a loss. It's you you paid for it and it's gone. Um, but that is the the arbitrary code vector, if 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 you will. Um, for that, you need to convince people to run your chain and whatever you code you, you have running in the chain, well, like in a, in a Bitcoin client, you can also put arbitrary code technically and get someone to run it. But you want to follow up? Okay. Well, the next slide then. Um, but am I seeing it right that you, for example, there's the famous case with Ethereum, With the uh, DAO, like when they had the hard fork between Ethereum and now it's Ethereum Classic, you couldn't have stopped it because it would it was like an infinite loop, and your hot patch is uh, deploying when the transaction is done and the new block is mined, right? I'm not sure. I, I'm going to question. Can you repeat that? So it would have been possible with your setup as well, right? <laughs> Uh, well, yes. Well, the DAO would right now run in a contract system, um, yeah. uh, but it's not in an infinite loop. It's just stuck um, in something that you cannot continue to execute, which is a different thing because it doesn't allow execution, endless execution. That's what Ethereum doesn't and what this contract system also doesn't because you have to pay for it and there's no endless money in the system, right? So it stops executing and this is um, part of why, why the DAO stopped. But the DAO cases, among other things, uh, One of the complicated ways that is why we don't force everybody to do that. Um, we are actually very certain that um, with that model, it makes more sense to not do that at all, but instead provide a more restrict and tailored to your use case set of, of features in your runtime. Um, let's say you're, you're a social network, Twitter, something like that. You don't need a blob that allows almost arbitrary execution that doesn't make sense um, but you can build most of the features that you want that would otherwise live on the server basically as features as a module in here that offers certain features um, to transactions to happen for transactions to happen and you can still bind that to the accounts and balance system so you could only tweet when you pay for it for example um, and therefore not make it arbitrary and uh, exploitable. But that is, for the first time, really up to the developers to decide, hey, this is the feature set of my backend, if you will, that I would like to see. Um, I think Ethereum allows, allows side chains for, I think, four or three blocks, and uh, how does it solve in this, or does it doesn't allow it in... So this is substrate itself is just one chain. The way to bridge to other chains is that substrate itself is already Polkadot aware, which is the other protocol. And because you ask, you get the other slide, um, which is effectively how how Polkadot does this messaging. Is it has one we call it relay chain, which is really just one blockchain that that continuously happens that knows of other chains. In the other networks are usually called side chains. We call them parachains because they run on the same network. And these can basically put messages into the relay chain and other, um, other parachains are interested in seeing them. But the basic idea of, of, um, of Ethereum when it was invented similar as po uh, Bitcoin was invented was what is called the, the idea of um, a blockchain maximalism. There's one blockchain to rule them all idea of the world. Um, this is exactly the opposite. It, it from the very start says there's multiple chains that have multiple features and that can talk to one another. And that also means there's always bridges necessary because there's always going to be chains that are not even within this network but run outside of the network. For example, Ethereum. There's no point in replacing the Ethereum network right now with a new network. It's also not going to happen. It's just too many people to convince. Um, so it makes more sense to, to work with bridges, for example, which is a common way to have continuous sidechains. Like the Coven network is technically a sidechain that can bridge tokens from Ethereum over through a contract into Coven network and vice versa. 
um, and that's effectively effectively how this works. But it's not it's something that Substrate always already comes with, and you can use. But you are free to decide whether you want to use that or not. You can just say, you know what, I'm running my own chain here in my bank or whatever. I don't want anyone in the other in the rest of the world to know this happens. Um, you could bridge it through uh, possible means to get this interoperability with other chains, um, or you can even go the the full route and say, you know what, I'm, I trust this network to run this um, system as well, and then it would you would apply to become a power chain. Um, but this is not something that that specific chain, the substrate network, um, fixes by itself. It just fixes it by being able to talk to Polkadot. Did that answer the question? Cool. Coming back to that then. Okay, I continue. So I have to give you the feature slide because, of course, that's not all we do. We don't just build a, the system to be hot swappable. Um, but that's one of the, the main features we talked about today. Um, the optional, really, they are optional um, modules that you can use for your chain, uh, also something that you, that you directly get with Substrate. As mentioned before, it um, was in runtime. So if you don't care about losing that potentially native speed effect, which is, we, we haven't really done measures yet, um, you could run it, you can build it in C, C++, or anything else that you can compile to, to Wasm as well, and just provide it from the start um, by itself. Um, it has this interchain compatibility with through Polkadot, so it can talk to other chains and exchange messages, tokens, um, anything else. Um, it will have hot swappable pluggable consensus, already has pluggable consensus, but the idea is that you could um, start using Substrate now, but Polkadot is not yet ready. Um, but you could already deploy it and already start using it and could later uh, upgrade that with the consensus algorithm that will be used as a parrot chain, um, which probably for the first for the for the first half year means you have to actually restart your client once. Um, but in the later version, and also this one I'm currently working on, this can also be done through the runtime itself. So the runtime itself could change the way it decides um, on consensus. There will be, or there are already light clients. Uh, I was asked about that before, meaning that you can connect to the network. You don't download the entire X gigabytes that it will be at some point, um, but you just more or less trust it, um, which is a great case for the browser where you just want to send something to the chain most of the time, or you look look up look something up from the chain. Um, there's chain synchronization already built in. You don't have to bother about that. There's a publish subscribe WebSocket API, um, which uh, is really nice for for the web interface, um, which which you can use to. Uh, that's not in order. Um, which you can use the with a compatible JavaScript library that is provided to interact with the chain. So the chain can, because we know of the features that exposes through Wasm we can expose them on the JavaScript side. So as soon as the new block becomes available, your JavaScript publish subscribe library already has that command and um, you can you can call it. It has a transaction queue system, secure networking, I mentioned that before, the JavaScript implementation should have been there because that's what I was talking about. Um, and it has telemetry, meaning that it's very easy to set up a server where you just ping your current information and you get a pretty interface. Um, and just in short, you can try it out today. It's already available. Go to Parity.io Substrate, and thank you very much. <laughs> See, it's half an hour plus. Um, before, I'm, before I'm kicked off the stage, um, first off, we're hiring. Who would have guessed? Mm. You can find all of them at Parity.io Jobs. Aside from this one, if you're interested in that, talk to me because it's not online yet, the database engineer. Uh, you can talk to me somewhere over there. You choose Substrate, and I'm still here for other questions. Was that a question? Do you have a question? No. But you don't have to ask questions. You already asked a lot of questions. Really good questions. So, um, I think it was asked before, and um, I think it 
was a little bit buried in my question, but you can't roll back, right? Like on a running note? Uh, we nuked our test chain once. We um, um, created a wasm binary that didn't actually work. <laughs> Voted upon it and it was active. Um, so we decided we will include a fail-safe mechanism that essentially um, is a part of the consensus algorithm allowing, um, if for example, your usual block time is four seconds, um, if after you change the code for another 60 seconds, no other block is authored because you can't actually create any because the block doesn't work anymore, there is a minority vote possible to revert the code from what it was before in order to be able to recover the chain. Right now, what we had to do was hack for it. <laughs> um, the system already also knows about the hot, like if you use our runtimes, um, the referendum can decide about bad blocks, can decide that certain blocks are considered bad and you are not allowed to author on top of those anymore, which is another mechanism to, to get around that. But the, the fail safe, as we call it, just be really rec able to recover to that one is a feature that we will implement in the runtime library. So it's not something that Substrate will provide by itself. But if you're using the runtime library uh, that we provide, then that one would. And uh, can you actually delete stuff from blocks and keep the consensus still up? Because I know a research group at my university discovered some like really bad and illegal contents in the Bitcoin uh, network and um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, regarding privacy and for example the right to be deleted, you have a, a general problem in almost all chains including this one because even if you say that you delete something now And from that point on in the transition um, history, it, it's shown as being deleted as the current state. It will always be in the log. Therefore, it is questionably at the moment whether that is considered legally it being deleted or not. Um, there's a good case to be made it's not. Um, and as soon as you start um, working on decentralized systems and consensus in decentralized systems, you realize that Within a decentralized systems, you can't guarantee deletion. It's just mathematically, topologically impossible. Um, and it will always be possible to recover to some degree if you have at least one node that wants that to happen, um, which is way lower than the PBFT, uh, than the uh, Byzantium fault tolerance, which is, would be only one third. But there is, it doesn't matter the size of the network, as long as you have one who wants it to be able to recover, you can always recover. And that is, therefore, it's impossible to actually delete in decentralized systems. Okay, thanks. I was wondering what the practical applications are of uh, the parachains, and do you already have any deployments that are used by real Life applications. Uh, starting with the starting with the last one. Um, so Polkadot is not let yet, not yet live. We're working on POC 3 at the moment, which is pluggable consensus, supposed to happen before the end of the year. Um, the idea is that we also want to have security audit and some other stuff happening, and that we'll have a live network by the end of next year. So there aren't any power chains yet for that particular case. Um, in regards to actual use cases, yes, uh, we, we, have, we are being approached more and more by different agencies that are very interested in becoming parachains. Um, in, in general, one thing I didn't talk about is the, the way that the relay chain works is it doesn't matter how the parachain comes to consensus, which means it could also again be a relay chain. So you can compose them in a hierarchical order, which makes it an interesting system for actual real world how many things are structured. For example, banking. Banking is a very simple use case where there are more and more banks because they have um, actually generally decentralized systems, like Sparkasse actually has different organizations for every state that basically by the end of the day, they all exchange information once to figure out what, where, where has my money moved throughout the day. But they start doing blockchains internally, and if they could use a relay chain to do that, 
they'd be very interested in that, to do that instead of their central banking system that they currently have, which fails sometimes. Um, and when you then go one step further and say, okay, now this bank doesn't only want to talk within its own network, but it wants to talk to another bank because they want to transfer money to that other bank, they would have a parachain as well, and they would connect on a higher level. That is, that is really the case that I know we're talking with organizations about, not the ones that I mentioned. Um, but in general, the being able from one chain to talk to another is a very common use case, actually. Even if you think just about uh, CryptoKitties, you want to actually pay CryptoKitties with Ethereum coins uh, at the beginning. So you need to, right now, they are run on a side chain that is directly connected. But even being able to transfer Bitcoin to Ethereum right now, you always have to go through an exchange which actually holds your money, which is a third party, which is exactly the opposite of what this entire network is supposed to be about. <laughs> um, deliver, removing these and having these things happen in the network itself. Um, I personally also think that aside from general um, security issues, the social network ideas specifically for public um, public information, like in, in the way that medium.com is a social network at the moment, uh, or other things like it, where it's mainly about having public um, uh, information. Exactly for those use cases, you would want, you would run your own chain because it's specific to what you do. And then you want to sell a sticker on that chain and you don't want to invent an another currency for that, but you want to be able to get currency from another existing chain, like Bitcoin or Ethereum. This is the general idea um, of these systems. Um, I always make that comparison. Think of Polkadot as the maybe HTTP layer, and then if you want to talk to a specific server, you still need to implement their API, but you generally have a way to connect to that server. That's the general purpose. And then if you want to, I don't know, get money, you today go from your e-commerce site to PayPal, for example, and call APIs that they do provide to you. And that is similar in the way, just not entities anymore, but networks, again, on that layer that provide that. Go ahead. There's a microphone. It's not really important, but how do you make money? Or how does parity make money? How, how I've parity? Seen you don't serve the clients, at least I don't think so. I've no, just been um, through the website. So, so the, the Ethereum client, for example, was just awarded a grant from the Ethereum Foundation about 5 million euros a couple of months back um, to continue development. And just generally that we did this. Uh, they, they made clear that this is a thank you grant from the community. Um, we're currently working with Zcash to build an implementation on, on top of Substrate, which they are paying for. Um, Protocol Labs was paying for the, 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 and is still paying for the implementation of LibP2P. In general, we're looking for partners who want to do something we want to do anyways, and they pay us for it. <laughs> Just a great business model so far. Um, but there's um, one idea specifically for Polkadot, where, so for, for these modules, we can provide further development on modules, so we can provide you modules that you don't have yet, um, and we would sell those, or we would actually, uh, there's this idea of creating a usage license system in which we say, as long as you use the Polkadot network, it's free to use, it's open source license in, in, uh, in any other way, but it's not free as open source free license, technically. Um, but you would have to pay a actual fee if you wanted to use it outside of that. So as long as you contribute to the higher network and as long as you contribute to the entire community, we're fine with you just using it. But if you wanted to use it within your organization, for example, or outside of that, or a different network, for that matter, you would have to pay. So a usage license fee that is personally free, if you will, um, is one of the ideas. Um, at this very moment, uh, Parity for Polkadot, Parity and Web3 did it on ICO, yay, um, over a year ago where they made a lot of money. We are not worried about money, which is really nice. And we don't really have investors. That's also nice. We still have a lot of money. Um, did I mention we're hiring? Yeah. <laughs> I want to tell you that again. The list is very long. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, 
so I wanted to ask you about the license because first you said that it's open source and then that you're not allowed to use it in some situations. It's not. It's not going to like I'm. I'm not in the business part. This is one idea. So the the software itself, everything that you've seen, everything that I showed you is is open source licensed. I'm not exactly sure which one. I think the LGPL, but I'm not exactly sure. Um, but the idea would be that um, if you that we provide some modules, that if you want to use those, we might have different licenses for those. And one of these ideas is a as long as you could surf the community license, use it kind of license, which would not be an open source license in any man, meaning of it. So I'll follow up with another question. Are you using proof of work and did you think about using something less wasteful? We're not using proof of work because we're using less less waste we're using less wasteful systems um, so the the way that Polkadot is going to be using it's a proof of authority system um, which we have been making very good experience have had very good experiences on uh, Coven the primary reason for that not not even being um, the the wastefulness of it but the speed we really for the Polkadot network, want a really low block time, meaning like it takes very seconds to create a new block in, allow, in order to allow very lot, a lot of throughput because, well, in the end of the day, it's going to need a lot of throughput. Um, and that's simply not possible with any known proof of work systems because if they would, would be very quick, they would be easy to cheat. Um, so um, that is why that is primarily a proof of authority system. Um, in general, though, because the consensus is pluggable, um, there is this idea to provide some chains which don't have finality um, in that sense as proof of work, uh, proof of authority provides. And there's also some ideas to provide some Polkadot cache like reference implementation that would use a similar system, um, mainly for the giggles of it, not because we believe that's a good idea. But you could. That's quite cool. Well, thank you. I'm still going to be around. To stick to. Oh yeah. Ah, take stickers. Take stickers. Take stickers. There's a lot of stickers. Take a lot of them. Different colors. I also have two buttons. Um, round stickers, black and white, and different colors. Go ahead. I thank you very much. I'll be around.